Hello, Marty Braden here. Welcome to my channel, especially those of you who are watching one of my videos for the very first time. Today's video is part four of my 10 part series of videos I'm calling the 10 big questions, which I condensed down from the nearly six hours uh, interview that Dr. John DeLynn did with the Paul brothers, Hayden and Jackson Paul, on his podcast called Mormon Stories. Today's topic or big question is, is there such a thing as objective morality? As a believing member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I have a deep and abiding testimony of God and of the reality of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. I also believe in the apostles and prophets that have been chosen to lead us in these the last days. These prophets' role is to be the protectors of the doctrines of Jesus Christ. One of those divine transcendent doctrines of Christ is summed up in a declaration that's called the family, a proclamation to the world, which was introduced to the world by one of those 15 prophets, the president of the LDS Church, Gordon B. Hinckley at that time. He read it as part of his message at the General Relief Society meeting held on September 23rd back in 1995 in Salt Lake City, Utah. For today's video, I'm going to focus on a particular doctrine contained in this family proclamation that says, quote, marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God and that the family is central to the Creator's plan for the eternal destiny of His children." End quote. This concept declares that each of us are God's offspring, even His very spirit children. This truth then is the mark or goal we should all be shooting for, to become like Him. We should do all we can to not look beyond this mark, which is usually done by becoming a law unto ourselves. All of our actions and behavior should be directed towards becoming a redeemed, reborn, resurrected, and exalted child of God, our eternal Father. Part of acting like and doing what a child of God should do is to make and keep covenants with God as we go on to create a family of our own. Not only here on this earth, but as we continue on after death and resurrection and live on into the eternities. This eternal family we're all a part of is the family of our eternal King of Kings. We each add to his glory as we become like him. He is the great head of the universe, and we are all part of his royal family. Once we come to know this mystery of godliness is true, our path and identity becomes ever more clear. The gospel of Jesus Christ, he being the anointed one, chosen by God to rule and reign on God's side with him, is summarized in the family proclamation which says, and I quote again, We, the First Presidency and the Council of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints solemnly proclaim that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God and that the family is central to the Creator's plan for the eternal destiny of his children which destiny includes their inheritance, of course. All human beings, male and female, notice there's just two genders listed here, are created in the image of God, each one a beloved spirit son or daughter of heavenly parents, and as such, each has a divine nature and destiny. I suggest that coming to understand and know what that destiny entails is one of life's greatest objectives our Heavenly Father has for us while we work out our probation while living here on earth. Continuing, it goes on to say what is meant by gender. It says, gender is an essential characteristic of individual, premortal, mortal, and eternal identity and purpose. I encourage you to take a moment to pause this video and reflect on that incredible declaration. In the premortal realm, spirit sons and daughters knew and worshiped God as their eternal father and accepted his plan by which his children could obtain a body, a physical body, which is what we're all doing right now, and then go on to our eternal reward of exaltation. So, what kind of experience is being referred to here? It's saying we are to progress towards perfection. Again, the Greek word used in the Bible for perfect or perfection is teleos. It's often translated as, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect or complete. But it has a more nuanced meaning of wholeness and completeness when you consider its Greek definition. Let's watch this short little video on teleos to see what it means. Teleos. So then be teleos as your heavenly father is teleos. This biblical Greek word, teleos, is often translated perfect. But what does that mean to be perfect? Teleos means something has fulfilled its purpose or achieved the goal for which it was made. God is the source and the purpose of everything, so God is teleos, because God is the goal of all things. But everything else is on a journey of becoming teleos. Like when the Apostle Paul says, don't be like children, but become teleos. 
He is inviting them to fulfill the purpose for which humans are made, which is to love each other. When something has achieved its purpose, it is healthy and whole. That's why in the Bible, something that is fully mature or even blameless can be called teleos. Like Jesus once said to a wealthy man, if you want to become teleos, sell your possessions and give to the poor. The proclamation goes on to say, and ultimately realize their divine destiny as heirs of eternal life, heirs being the literal spirit offspring who are being offered their promised inheritance, thus adding to fathers honor and glory and responsibility. He being the head of this eternal family of sons and daughters who exist here on earth and throughout the universe, the proclamation continues, the divine plan of happiness enables family relationships to be perpetuated beyond the grave, sacred ordinances and covenants available. I would slip in here available only in holy temples, make it possible for individuals to return to the presence of God and for families to be united eternally. The first commandment that God gave to Adam and Eve pertained to their potential for parenthood as husband and wife. We declare that God's commandment for his children to multiply and replenish the earth remains in force today. This commandment was the chief commandment that God charged this first couple on earth with. Continuing, we further declare that God has commanded that the sacred power of procreation, for anyone who doesn't know what the sacred power of procreation is, as it's mentioned here, it is the power to create life through sexual relations. And that power to create a life is to be exercised only between a man and a woman who have been married legally and in the way that God has ordained. This power of procreation, it continues, is to be employed only between a man and a woman lawfully wedded as husband and wife. We declare the means by which mortal life is created to be divinely appointed. We affirm the sanctity of life and of its importance in God's eternal plan. Notice all of the big issues this proclamation has covered so far. And also notice that it says the sanctity of life and not just the sanctity of babies who have reached their complete gestation. In other words, when the seed of the man joins with the egg of the woman, life has been created. All of the necessary material called genes and intelligence needed for the individual to be a distinct person is all there at conception. Let me show you a video that affirms this to be true. So I just want to make the point that when you start from Genesis 1 to 11, you develop the right way of thinking about everything. It's a Christian worldview. When I was a teacher, I was told to teach the six kingdoms of life. And two in particular, the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. But you know one of the things I've recognized? You know, the more we look at what's happening in our culture and how younger generations have been indoctrinated, if you use the criterion made in the image of God, you'd have an extra kingdom, the human kingdom. And because of where our culture is at, I think we need to stand back and say, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, right now they're being taught man's just a part of the animal kingdom. Even in most of our Christian schools, they teach that. You see, if you go across the river to the Cincinnati Zoo, and you visit the ape exhibit, you'll find that they're telling you, you visit your family. And they have this sign that says, we are not, after all, the only beings with personalities, rational thought and emotions. There is no sharp line dividing us from the chimps and other apes. We humans are a part of and not separate from the animal kingdom. That's what the world is teaching generations of kids. Here's part of the animal kingdom. And by the way, no sharp line. Between us and the chimps, every zoo I've gone to has had a really sharp line. <laughs> so, humans are different to animals. We're made in the image of God. Now, at fertilization, you get DNA from the male, DNA from the female. And this is some of the animation from our fearful and wonderfully made exhibit. At fertilization, you then have all the information that builds a human being. And the Bible tells us we're made in the image of God. Because you see, as the body is developed from the information in the DNA, no new information is added. What does that mean? That means we're made in God's image right from fertilization. So abortion would be killing a human being right from fertilization. Now, God substantiates this. This has already been quoted today. 
Psalm 139. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. While I was being put together, my body was being put together. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You were, I saw my unformed substance. Even while the substance was unformed, your body wasn't formed, it was still you. Still a human being. Made in the image of God. Now, Kamala Harris recently has been giving talks about the abortion issue, but she's always on about women's rights, as she puts it. And this is a tweet she sent uh, some time ago. The rights of women to make decisions about their own bodies is not negotiable. The right of women to make decisions about their own bodies is their decision, it is their body. Number one, she's wrong scientifically. Number two, she's wrong biblically. You see, a fertilized egg is not part of a woman's body. I mean, if it's a male, it has a Y chromosome that didn't come from the woman. How could that be a part of her body? Not only that, what is interesting is that, you know, if you have a kidney transplant, you have to take anti-rejection rejection drugs because your body recognises it's foreign tissue. A fertilised egg is recognised by a woman's body as foreign tissue to reject. But God built an anti-rejection mechanism into the uterus so the individual, the body can develop. Isn't that amazing? It really is. Now, at the Creation Museum, we have this wonderful, fearfully fearfully and wonderfully made exhibit and it's incredible and I encourage you to spend time in there and in this new exhibit that we just opened, we had a temporary one, uh, we use what's called the Pepper's Ghost technology. So as you look at the 3D models, you'll actually see things happening. For instance, when you look at the model of the egg, which is greatly magnified and we tell you how much, we have the big circle to say that, you will actually see the fertilization of an egg um, it, it's, it's an incredible technology that we use to show uh, that happening. And then, I, I don't have the videos for these, just to show you the progression in the videos, you'll see 24 days of life and it'll tell you, you're looking at heartbeat, even at 24 days of life, by the way. Um, and uh, so it goes on, you'll see the brain develop in the skeletal system and, and uh, also uh, the gastrointestinal system and so it goes on, that's what it's all about. So, to finish with, I'm just going to walk off the stage here so you can just concentrate on what she said. Uh, because I, I think, you know, for a 14-year-old, it's an incredible speech. And uh, so, here it is. Welcome to the committee. Please go ahead and state your name and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Abby Hewitt, and I'm, on, I'm here on behalf of myself. I'm 14 years old. I was born with three critical congenital heart defects. I was rushed into surgery when I was just five hours old. Doctors told my parents I only had a 40% chance of making it through surgery. This is what I looked like after my surgery. Um, doctors expected my recovery to take one to two months. I was in the cardiac ICU for just 12 days. The doctors told my parents that I would be small possibly have hearing and vision problems, learning disabilities, and would not be able to play sports. I am in the 86th percentile for my height and have perfect vision and hearing. I'm a straight-A student. I love sports. I play basketball, AAU basketball, volleyball, off-season volleyball. I run the 400 meter, which we all know is the hardest track event. I pole vault. I run the 100 and 200 meter dashes. I think adults often focus on med what medical doctors say and believe them to be 100% accurate. These are the things that medical doctors said about me, but here I stand, healthy and thriving. Please don't forget about people like me. In 2021, at least 183 babies just like me were aborted in Minnesota. We have the right to live. I'm not a statistic or defined by my heart defect. I am not a defect. My life verse is Psalm 139, 14. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This verse is super impactful to me because I am fearfully and wonderfully made, heart defects and all. It's a great reminder every day that I was created on purpose for a purpose. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Hill. Appreciate your being here today. 
For the most part, I have enjoyed and appreciated Ken Ham and his effort to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have a category on my YouTube channel's playlist titled Ken Ham. Anyway, continue now with the proclamation. It says, a husband and wife have a solemn responsibility to love and care for each other and for their children. Children are an inheritance of the Lord. Psalms 127 verse 3. Parents have a sacred duty to rear their children in love and righteousness, to provide for their physical and spiritual needs, and to teach them to love and serve one another. Observe the commandments of God and be law-abiding citizens wherever they live. To live in any other way in terms of family and creating a family with children of our own, it is to reject God's sovereignty and his plan for life here on this earth, which he organized for us so that we could learn and follow his plan for our happiness while we're living here on earth. And so we would be presented a choice whether or not we will pursue his plan for us or choose our plan for our life. Yes, we are certainly free to choose what we want to do with our lives, but God makes it clear that if we choose to do our own thing, we are rejecting his plan. He said, remember, you are free to choose, but I forbid it. For in that day, he says, the consequences of the choice of disobedience is death. He said, husbands and wives, mothers and fathers, you will be held accountable before me for the discharge of these obligations. The family is ordained of God. Marriage between men and women is essential to his eternal plan. Children are entitled to birth within the bonds of matrimony and to be reared by a father and a mother who honor marital vows with complete fidelity. Happiness, for this is God's plan of happiness, in family life is most likely to be achieved when founded upon the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. God goes on to share how this is accomplished. Here's what he said, quote, Successful marriages and families are established and maintained on principles. And what are those principles? What are the laws that, if followed, will bring about this happiness in one's marriage and family? He says they are faith, prayer, repentance, forgiveness, respect, love, compassion, work, and wholesome recreational activities. End quote. So, now that we know that what these principles and laws are, generally speaking, the obvious question is, what are the roles of a father and of a mother in this union? God gives the answer to this in his next comment. He says, quote, By divine design, fathers are to preside over their families in love and righteousness and are responsible to provide the necessities of life and protection for their families. Mothers, on the other hand, have the primary responsibility for the nurture of their children. In these sacred responsibilities, fathers and mothers are obligated to help one another as equal partners. There's no underling relationship here. Both are equal in authority and power in the home. Both are to serve side by side and not behind, ahead of, or under one another. The proclamation continues. Disability, death, or other circumstances may necessitate individual adaptation. Extended families should lend support when needed. So, now that we have a pretty clear understanding of the why the family unit is how the world's people are to be organized, the big question remains, what holds it all together? The answer to this question is found in what God says next. He says, we warn that individuals who violate covenants of chastity, who abuse spouse or offspring, or who fail to fulfill family responsibilities will one day stand accountable before God. So the glue that holds the family together, in my humble opinion, appears to be boiled down to the law of chastity, which can also be defined as objective morality. I will address objective truth and objective morality in a little while, but I want to first mention what God said next. He said, Further, we warn that the disintegration of the family, the most important and fundamental unit of society, will bring upon individuals, communities, and nations the calamities foretold by ancient and modern prophets. End quote. I would have you take an inventory of today's society and ask yourself, where does the nuclear family stand today in terms of its solidarity or its disintegration? Continue now. We call upon responsible citizens and officers of government everywhere to promote those measures designed to maintain and strengthen the family as the fundamental unit of society. In Dr. Dillon's interview of the Paul brothers, the topics of truth, 
meaning subjective and objective truth, as well as objective and subjective morality, were discussed. Before I dive into this, let me set the table a little further by playing for you a video of a Latter-day Saint prophet and apostle who just passed away last November 12th of 2023. In his message, Elder Ballard discussed false prophets and false teachers who teach a false morality. False prophets and false teachers are those who attempt to change the God-given and scripturally based doctrines that protect the sanctity of marriage the divine nature of the family, and the essential doctrine of personal morality. They advocate a redefinition of morality to justify fornication, adultery, and homosexual relationships. Some openly champion the legalization of so-called same-gender marriages. To justify their rejection of God's immutable laws that protect the family, these false prophets and false teachers even attack the inspired proclamation on the family issued to the world in 1995 by the First Presidency and the Twelve Apostles. Regardless of which particular false doctrines they teach, false prophets and false teachers are an inevitable part of the last days. False prophets, according to the prophet Joseph Smith, always arise to oppose the true prophets. However, in the Lord's Church there is no such thing as loyal opposition. One is either for the kingdom of God and stands in defense of God's prophets and apostles, or one stands opposed. And as Lehi of old counseled his sons, so this counsel is true for us today. And the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time, that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. And because that they are redeemed from a fall, they have become free forever, knowing good from evil, to act for themselves and not be acted upon, save it be by the punishment of the law at the great and last day, according to the commandments which God hath given. Wherefore men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto man, and they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. And now, my sons, I would that ye should look to the great mediator and hearken unto his great commandments, and be faithful unto his words, and choose eternal life according to the will of his Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, the exact time of the second coming is known only to the Father. There are, however, signs that scriptural prophecy relating to that tumultuous day is being fulfilled. Jesus cautioned several times that prior to his second coming, many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. As apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is our duty to be watchmen on the tower, warning church members to beware of false prophets and false teachers who lie in wait to ensnare and destroy faith and testimony. Today we warn you that there are false prophets and false teachers arising. And if we're not careful, even those who are among the faithful members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will fall victim to their deception. With Elder Ballard's comments fresh on our minds, let's listen to who I believe is a false teacher who I think means well, and that's because he cares about those who struggle with aligning their lives to the commandments of God, and as a result find themselves in deep emotional and spiritual conflict, even to the point where their struggles become too much for them, and they contemplate dying, even taking or acting on their thoughts of taking their own lives, which is why Dr. DeLynn refers to the church's community as being even deadly for some. Let's listen to what he says. So if I told you there was a treasure in the ground, 
and we and we believed that both of us believed that that treasure was in the ground, but we were digging in different places, and we had differing ideas of how we should dig and what what equipment we should use and whatever. That's completely different than one of us saying there's a treasure in the ground, and the other one saying there's not. So what's the point? See, that's why I'm ta- that's why I'm asking about this objective truth idea because if you don't believe that there is an objective meta truth that underlies all reality, then our conversations conversations about anything can only go so far because then it just comes down to my lived experience says different. But what, what you're not acknowledging, and I keep trying to say this is, let's just say that we all agree that there is an objective truth out there, okay. but we all disagree about what that objective truth is. What's the value of asserting that there is an objective truth to begin with? in the in our lived experiences because then because then we know that we're we're digging for the same thing does that does that make sense i think i i think we're digging for minimizing human suffering and maximizing human goodness yeah and i don't need a belief in an objective truth to share that with either of you Mm -hmm. so and we have to to have that conversation which i think it's important let's have it we have we have to do some we can't go roots and then branches roots and branches if we just keep doing that we're never going to get anywhere we have to stay at this point is there an objective morality what what like do you think that i i don't know i don't know well, that's something you know uh, you guys say i don't know a lot that's something i would say i don't know yeah well obviously to a certain extent you have to believe in something because you say a lot of things you say the do- the doctrine of the atonement is insidious so I didn't say that. I said it can be insidious or it can be applied in ins- insidious ways. Okay, so insidious ways. How, how, insidious. how do you deem those things insidious then? Yeah, I have values. Okay. Where do they come from? Like a lot of them came from Mormonism. Okay. okay. Well, it, it's important that we're having we have that conversation because uh, even the idea of science itself is based on the idea that there is an objective truth and we're trying to discover it. Does that make sense? I would but say no. Problem- I would say science would not say that there's an objective truth. I'd say really? science would say that we can observe things and collect data and then draw conclusions about the data that's collected based on those observations. But not what we, that science is tapping in. What are we trying to, to observe? Truth. What are we Reality. Trying? Reality. Reality, which is based on what? What we observe and experience. Okay. <laughs> like, and I think this is a, one of the fundamental issues, and I maybe we're at an impasse to some degree on this, where it's like, if we don't have a standard, so, like, is your belief then that your standard and our standard can never be reconciled and everybody has their own standard and there isn't a standard a meta standard that can be discovered by everyone so you do believe in a subjective i think we share way more values than we differ on i'd say we share 95 percent of our values but are those rooted in something real or are they just because we have a similar lived experience see they're That's rooted a, in culture. They're rooted in in our psychology. They're rooted in history. Hmm. They're root, they're rooted in our collective experience. The fact that it must be that way, I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's just that's the way it is. But yes. why is calling that absolute truth? How does that add any more value than a secular observation that both aren't going anywhere? Okay. Also, there's different types of morality, right? Mm-hmm. So. Faithful Mormons can be involved in financial fraud. Like you ask a, an expert in financial fraud from New York, what state is kind of per capita the capital financial fraud? They're going to say Utah. Mm-hmm. Try it. And that's a different type of morality. So active faithful Mormons can have significant moral problems too, or mental health problems, whether it's prescription drug abuse, whether it's pornography addiction or use. Mm-hmm. Um, there are lots of societal ills that active faithful Mormons, a child abuse, mm-hmm. child abuse is rampant within active faithful Mormonism by any measure. By what, stand, by what standard like, is it? Go to the FBI ranked? and look at per capita reports of child sexual abuse, Utah, comes up very high in the in the rankings from what i understand talking to 
people in the FBI that investigate child abuse. Mm -hmm. you, look, fact check me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Please correct well, it's me. Just, it's really important like when you're going to make a statement like that. To, like that's a really bold statement. And so you should have the source. Okay. So I'll just say don't believe me. <laughs> Look that up. That's my understanding. It's like a really big thing to say. Okay. You can say that about the Catholic Church because there have been tons of reports, and you can see the actual sources. Oh well, you you I I, I guarantee you there have mm -hmm. been tons of reports of of child sexual abuse within Mormonism. I'm sure, but yeah. when you just make look that at the Boy Scouts source. of America. Boy Scouts of America. Uh -huh. Eight. I think there's eighty thousand mm -hmm. Mormon um, reports of child sexual abuse just in the Boy Scouts of America case alone mm -hmm. by observing the impact of it okay. without either of us claiming to have um, a, some sort of a command of an eternal objective truth. Yeah. So knowing what the objective truth is different, like understanding and being able to conceptualize and articulate is different than believing that there is an objective truth. Do you see what I'm saying? I see what you're saying, but I don't know why it matters to assert that there's an objective truth if we cannot in practice really agree on what that is and what drives your perceptions of, of objective truth mm -hmm. is what Mormon prophets have said or what Mormon prophets wrote. You just based a lot of your theology on a book where the person whose name is on the book or the chapter that you just quoted from likely didn't exist at all. We don't have to agree on the objective truth. We have to agree whether or not there is an objective truth. What good because, is it if we can't figure out what it is and agree on it? What good is it? It's just a, it's, uh -huh. it's literally a philosophical question that actually doesn't help us. Yeah, no, it does. Because uh, if we agree that something exists, then we can argue about what that existence, how that existence is manifested. There's an alternative, but which is if there's a constant goalpost move where it's like we believe in an objective truth and you believe in a, a subjective truth, it's all lived experience and personal, then we have nothing that we can talk that's about not because true. we have nothing that, to know. No, because we can both look at, we can observe how much pain and suffering certain decisions cost mm -hmm. or cause, and we can kind of agree. But is suffering yeah, bad? Holocaust? I don't need a God. I don't need some belief in an objective morality to know that a Holocaust is bad. Okay. So it's that's just, objectively evil is what you're saying. I think we can agree that the, that the impact of that causes so much harm and damage and sadness. We can agree that it's not a good thing. So if I understand correctly, that, that would be kind of the definition of a subjective morality. I mean, it's, uh, it's because, because, you know, if we, if, we live here at this time now, but if we grew up in uh, a household that is white supremacist, neo-Nazi type thing, and they're told that way, then because that's their lived experience in their culture and their history, then that is true. So what I'm understanding is that you actually, that's it's not that you don't. Reality, that's their perceptions. That's their values. And so is that true though? Is it objectively true? Like, is there an objective truth? And so what I'm understanding is that you don't think that there is. I don't is. think an, ob an absolute objective truth is knowable in any way that we could all agree to it and then find value in it. I think mm -hmm. everybody has their opinion and their perspective about what's true, including Orthodox devout believing Mormons, including pro Mormon prophets, seers, or revelators. So the idea that there is an objective truth out there is not super useful given that none of us, including Mormon prophets, can even agree on what that objective truth is. First of all, I want to be fully transparent with what I did with the video clip we just watched. I took Dr. Dillon's five and a half hour interview and have uh, cut snippets out of it. And in the case of this particular long clip, I merged several snippets together to get a full picture of John's view on moral objectivity and uh, objective truth. I tried not to take his comments out of context, but I did shorten the full conversation in order to save time for you, my viewers. In Dr. Delin's comments, he said that all of us agree on the subjective truths or realities observed consequences as being awful. However, I disagree with that assessment. And that's because one just has to look no further than to Hitler and the Holocaust, who thought his extermination of the Jews by any means, even using gas chambers to gas them, which resulted in the reality of more than six million Jews being exterminated, not counting other atrocities and murders, to see that his subjective truth told him that it 
it was righteous to do this. Hitler felt that way because Jews were a scourge upon the world, he said. So to say that anyone knows evil when they see it is just not objectively true. For those of you watching this, you can email um, me for a PDF copy of my recent book I just published titled An Atheist Delusion, where I wrote an entire chapter to the topic of objective truth, including objective morality. I think you'll enjoy it. Also, Dr. DeLynn implied in this interview that Utah was one of the highest ranked states of child abuse cases, right? He did say, though, that we should look it up and correct him if he was wrong. Well, I did. And the following chart, in my opinion, says otherwise, John. I might suggest that you pause the video here and really look at this chart. As you will see, Utah is ranked 23rd down the list out of 50 states. So I just want you to know that if you look at this particular chart, you'll see it's right smack dab in the middle of the 50 states. So that's not high up on the list, John, but any kind of child abuse or abuse or sin like that or is so destructive and God will not be mocked. There will be a punishment. So with that in mind, let's continue. Another point I would like to make regarding Dr. DeLynn's beliefs is that he keeps saying the church instead of the gospel of Jesus Christ when referring to what brings about this community he misses. It's really messy and complex, though. That's my turn. He said, I think the church excels in creating community. The fact is, it's not the church that does this. It's the principles and doctrines of the gospel of Jesus Christ that when they're lived, as Jesus has commanded us to live, live them, they work and they are what builds this community of saints. It's living the gospel principles that are objectively moral that creates the kind of moral community being referred to by both Jackson and John. In other words, it's the gospel and its doctrines, the doctrines of Jesus Christ that are perfect and the source of unity and love and oneness when we live them. The church consists of members of the church, all of whom are fallen human beings and therefore not perfect, nor will it ever be in this fallen world. It's simply the horsepower that builds the community. Of course, you're going to find within the church's membership some people who have not, do not, and will not follow the commandments of the gospel of Jesus Christ or what Dr. DeLynn calls the high demand of religion or Mormon orthodoxy. These people are called the tares, John, amongst the wheat. We just heard Dr. DeLynn say that some of those demands of Mormon orthodoxy can cause or lead someone to take their life. For example, the demand to be, in his words, something you're not. We're told to be straight and don't participate in the behaviors of homosexuality or lesbianism and transgenderism. If you do, you should not expect to be able to come to church, he says, and be treated as a member in full fellowship, end quote. I will say this to John and all of you watching this video. All members of the Church of Jesus Christ fall somewhere on the spectrum of obedience and righteousness. At one end of is complete baseness and, at, and debauchery, and at the other end is perfection and complete righteousness. Very few are right there. Like Dr. DeLynn has said, there are multiple factors that have influence on how a person views the world, their lives, and the way they live their lives. Again, all of us have sinned and have fallen short of the mark of being the kind of child of God that he desires us to be. That said, it is true that some members of the church judge others with the beam in their eye while they themselves are living outside of the path we all have been called to try. I submit to those who are watching this video, you, to say that a woman portrayed in the Hulu shows are viable, uh, true members of the Lord, active members of the Lord's church, or what John keeps calling Mormons, are not active Latter-day Saints in the true sense of the world. Good grief. They are mocking Christ's gospel, and Dr. DeLynn knows it in his heart. Such persons do not reflect the goodness that is found in the LDS church. On the other hand, I do agree with Dr. DeLynn when he says that there are members of the church who are breaking the commandments of God. For sure, these so-called members portray themselves as active members in full standing often. There are some lower-level leaders of the church who served as scout leaders, for example, who were predatory pedophiles looking for their next prey amongst a group of vulnerable young boys, this being just one example of wolves in sheep's clothing who make a mockery of God and his church by demeaning Christ's beautiful gospel as it's taught by Jesus Christ. It's just sad. That said, let's jump into the question of whether or not an objective truth will help establish the necessity for it or the idea that there is no need for it, which is Dr. Dunn's point of view. Let's listen to what John says in his own words. By observing the impact of it okay. without 
either of us claiming to have um, a, some sort of a command of an eternal objective truth. Yeah, so knowing what the objective truth is different, like understanding and being able to conceptualize and articulate is different than believing that there is an objective truth. Do you see what I'm saying? I see what you're saying, but I don't know why it matters to assert that there's an objective truth if we cannot, in practice, really agree on what that is and what drives your perceptions of, of objective truth mm -hmm. is what Mormon prophets have said or what Mormon prophets wrote. You just based a lot of your theology on a book where the person whose name is on the book or the chapter that you just quoted from likely didn't exist at all. Once again, Dr. Lynn shows his confirmed bias, dri driven by his worldview of disbelief in moral objectivity. John dismisses the idea of objective truth because of his disbelief in God, or at least the God religion is put forth. And therefore to him, there is no objective word of God. He believes it is just the writings of fallible men who he believes didn't even exist in the first place. This attitude of rebellion reminds me of Korahor, an antichrist from the Book of Mormon, who when asked, do you believe in God? by the chief high priest of the church, Jacob, who was the younger brother of the prophet Nephi. Listen to what Korhor said about objective truth. It came to pass in the latter end of the 17th year, there came a man into the land of Zarahemla, and he was anti-Christ. For he began to preach unto the people against the prophecies which had been spoken by the prophets concerning the coming of Christ. Why do you look for a Christ? For no man can know of anything which is to come. Behold, ye cannot know of things which ye do not see. Therefore ye cannot know that there shall be a Christ. Ye look forward and say ye see a remission of your sins? And many more such things did he say unto them, telling them that there could be no atonement made for the sins of men. But every man fared in this life according to the management of the creature. Therefore every man prospered according to his genius, and that every man conquered according to his strength. And whatsoever a man did was no crime. And thus he did preach unto them, leading away the hearts of many, causing them to lift up their heads in their wickedness. Yea, leading away many women and also men to commit whoredoms, telling them that when a man was dead, that was the end thereof. And he came over into the land of Gideon and began to preach unto them also. And here he did not have much success, for he was taken and bound and carried before the high priest and also the chief judge over the land. Why? Why do you go about perverting the ways of the Lord? Why do you teach this people that there shall be no Christ? To interrupt their rejoicings? Why? Why do you speak against all the prophecies of the holy prophets. Because I do not teach the foolish traditions of your fathers. And because I do not teach this people to bind themselves down under the foolish ordinances and performances which were laid down by ancient priests to usurp power and authority over them, to keep them in ignorance that they must not lift up their heads, but be brought down according to thy words. Ye say that this people is a free people? Behold, I say they are in bondage. And ye say that these ancient prophecies are true? Behold, I say that ye do not know that they are true. And these people are a guilty and a fallen people because of the transgression of a parent. Behold, I say that a child is not guilty because of its parents. And ye also say that Christ shall come. And he shall be slain for the sins of the world. And thus ye lead away this people after the foolish traditions of your fathers and according to your own desires and keep them down even as it were in bondage that ye may glut yourselves with the labors of their hands. That they durst not look up with boldness and that they durst not enjoy their rights and privileges. Yea, they durst not make use of that which is their own lest they should offend their priests who do yoke them according to their desires, and have brought them to believe by their traditions, and their dreams, and their whims, and their visions, and their pretended mysteries, that they should, if they do not do according to their words, offend some unknown being who they say is God, a being who never has been seen Enough. or known, who never was, nor ever will be. Enough. Now when the high priest and chief judge saw the hardness of his heart, yea, when they saw that he would revile even against God, 
They would not make any reply to his words, but they caused that he should be bound, and they delivered him up into the hands of the officers and sent him to the land of Zarahemla, that he might be brought before Alma and the chief judge who was governor over all the land. Why do ye lead away this people after the silly traditions of your fathers? Ye keep them down in bondage, Silence. that ye may glut yourselves with the labors of their hands, that they durst not look up with boldness and enjoy their rights and privileges. Thou knowest that we do not glut ourselves on the labors of these people. For behold, I have labored even from the commencement of the reign of judges until now with my own hands for my support. Notwithstanding my many travels round about the land to declare the word of God among my people, and notwithstanding my many labors which I have performed in the church, I have never received even so much as one senine for my labor. Now, if we do not receive anything for our labors in the church, what doth it profit us to labor in the church, save it were to declare the truth that we may have rejoicing in the joy of our brother? And why sayest thou that we preach to get gain when thou of thyself knowest that we receive no gain? Believest thou that we deceive this people that causes such joy in their hearts? Yea. Make them keep it down. Quiet now. Believest thou that there is a God? Nay. Will ye deny again that there is a God and also deny the Christ? For behold, I say unto you, I know there is a God and also that Christ shall come. What evidence have ye that there is no God, or that Christ cometh not? I say unto you, ye have none, save your word only. But behold, I have all things as a testimony that these things are true. And ye also have all things as a testimony that they are true. And will ye deny them? Believest thou these things are true? I know that thou believest, but thou art possessed with a lying spirit, and ye have put off the Spirit of God that it may have no place in you. But the devil has power over you, and he doth carry you about, working devices to destroy the children of God. If thou wilt show unto me a sign, that I may be convinced that there is a God. Yea, show unto me he hath power, and then I will be convinced of the truth of thy words. Thou hast had signs enough. Will ye tempt your God? The scriptures are laid before thee. All things denote there is a God. Even the earth and all things upon the face of it, and its motion, and also all the planets, which move in their regular form, do witness there is a supreme creator. And yet ye go about leading away the hearts of this people, testifying unto them there is no God. Yet will ye deny against all these witnesses? Yea, I will deny unless ye show me a sign. I am grieved because of the hardness of your heart, that ye will still resist the spirit of truth, that thy soul shall be destroyed. But behold, it is better that thy soul should be lost than that thou shouldest be the means of bringing many souls down to destruction by thy flattering words. Therefore, if ye shall deny again, God shall smite thee, that thou shalt become dumb, that thou shalt never open thy mouth any more, and that thou shalt not deceive this people any more. I do not deny the existence of a God.
but I do not believe that there is a God. And I say that ye do not know that there is a God, and except ye show me a sign, I will not believe. This will I give unto thee for a sign, that thou shalt be struck dumb according to my words. In the name of God, ye shall be struck dumb, ye shall no more have utterance. When the chief judge saw this, he put forth his hand and wrote unto Korihor, saying, Art thou convinced of the power of God? In whom did ye desire that Alma should show forth his sign? Behold, he has showed unto you a sign, and now will ye dispute more. And now Korihor put forth his hand and wrote, I know that nothing save it were the power of God could bring this upon me. Yea, and I always knew that there was a God. But behold, the devil hath deceived me, and he taught me that which I should say, and I taught them insomuch that I verily believed that they were true. And for this cause I withstood the truth, even until I have brought this great curse upon me. And it came to pass that they were all convinced of the wickedness of Korihor. Therefore they were all converted again unto the Lord. And Korihor did go about from house to house, begging food for his support among a people who had separated themselves from the Nephites. And as he went forth amongst them, behold, he was run upon and trodden down, even until he was dead. And thus we see the end of him who perverteth the ways of the Lord. And thus we see that the devil will not support his children at the last day, but doth speedily drag them down to hell. With Korhor's story fresh in our minds, let me play for you the words of living prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, where he talks about the five objective truths that Dr. Dillon says are just the creation of a frenzied, unschooled mind. My dear brothers and sisters, I wish to discuss five truths that I feel impressed to share with you. Truth number one, you are sons and daughters of God. You already know this, you've sung about it ever since you were toddlers. But let me clarify a distinguishing characteristic about your identity. You are the children whom God chose to be part of his battalion during this great climax in the long-standing battle between good and evil, between truth and error. I would not be surprised if, when the veil is lifted in the next life, we learn that you actually pled with our Heavenly Father to be reserved for now. I would not be surprised to learn that, pre-mortally, you love the Lord so much that you promised to defend His name and gospel during this world's tumultuous winding-up scenes. One thing is certain, you are of the House of Israel, and you have been sent here to help gather God's elect. Truth number two, truth is truth. Some things are simply true. The arbiter of truth is God, not your favorite social media news feed, not Google, and certainly not those who are disaffected from the church. President Spencer W. Kimball taught that absolute truth cannot be altered by the opinions of men. If men are really humble, they will realize that they discover but do not create 
truth. Many now claim that truth is relative and that there is no such thing as divine law or a divine plan. Such a claim is simply not true. There is a difference between right and wrong. Truth is based upon the laws God has established for the dependability, protection, and nurturing of His children. Eternal laws operate in and affect each of our lives, whether we believe them or not. Truth number three. God loves every one of us with perfect love. More than anything, our Father wants His children to choose to return home to Him. Everything He does is motivated by His yearning desire. The entire reason we are here on earth is to qualify to live with Him forever. We do that by using our agency to find and stay on the covenant path that leads back to our heavenly home. God knew that because of the adversary's deceptive tactics and traps, the covenant path would not be easy to find or to stay on. So He sent His only begotten Son to atone for us and to show us the way. The godly power available to all who love and follow Jesus Christ is the power to heal us, strengthen us, cleanse us from sin, and magnify us to do things we never could do on our own. Our Savior is the divine exemplar who marked the path that we are to follow. Because the Father and the Son love us with infinite, perfect love, and because they know we cannot see everything they see, they have given us laws that will guide and protect us. There is a strong connection between God's love and His laws. I have come to see the significance of that connection and the power of divine law. Two experiences may illustrate. The first I see as a parent. I am the grateful father of nine daughters and one son. I love them with all my heart. As our children were growing up, their mother and I established family rules to keep them safe and facilitate their growth. Our children did not always like or understand the rules. But because we loved them, we were willing to do all we could to guide and protect them. Well, as much as I love my children, I can only imagine how much God loves each of us because His love for us is infinite. The Apostle Paul taught that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just as the rules that my wife and I developed for our children were motivated by love, God's laws reflect His perfect love for each of us. His laws keep us spiritually safe and help us to progress eternally. Well, the second experience by which I came to see the power of divine law came during my career as a medical doctor and scientific researcher. After graduating from medical school, I pursued advanced education in surgery. At that time, there was no such thing as heart surgery. Then, 
I teamed up with other researchers in the daunting task of making an artificial heart and lung machine. We knew that such an apparatus could possibly maintain the body's circulation while repairs might be made on the heart. But during that early era, there was much we did not know. Then one day, two truths articulated in the Doctrine and Covenants spoke to my inquiring mind. These truths were, first, that all blessings are predicated upon obedience to law, and second, that to every kingdom there is a law given. Well, I reasoned that if every kingdom had the law, there must be laws that govern the beating heart. I was determined to discover those laws and obey them. By doing so, blessings would come, and lives could be saved. In medical school, I had been taught that if one touched the beating heart, it would stop. However, one of the first things we discovered in the lab was that we could touch the heart of an animal without losing its heartbeat. This finding opened the door later to uncovering another law that made more complex open-heart operations possible. We learned that if we added potassium chloride to blood flowing into the coronary arteries, thereby altering the normal sodium and potassium ratio, the heart would stop beating instantly. Then, when we nourished the heart with blood that had a normal sodium-potassium ratio, the heart would spring back to its normal beating pattern. Literally, we could turn the heart off long enough to repair it and then turn it back on again. Decades later, when I explained this to a group of medical students, one prominent professor asked, but what if it doesn't work? My answer, it always works, <laughs> because it's based on divine law. Divine law is incontrovertible. The same can be said of the law of gravity, the laws of foil and lift that will allow airplanes to fly. Each is an absolute truth. Doctors or pilots do not have the power to change those laws, but their understanding of them safeguards lives. My dear brothers and sisters, divine laws are God's gifts to His children. Just as our family's rules kept our children safe as they grew to adulthood, just as divine laws governing the heart and the flight of airplanes keep you safe on the operating table or while traveling, Abiding by God's laws will keep you safe as you progress toward eventual exaltation. Let me say it as succinctly as I can. As you abide by God's laws, you are progressing toward exaltation. The Prophet Joseph Smith taught that God instituted laws whereby we could have the privilege to advance like Himself. God's greatest blessings are reserved for those who obey His laws. As He explained, For all who will have a blessing at my hands shall abide the law which was appointed for that blessing. God's laws are motivated entirely by His infinite love for us and His desire for us to become all we can become. Truth number four. The Lord Jesus Christ, whose Church this is, appoints prophets and apostles to communicate His love and to teach His laws. The gospel of Jesus Christ is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. 
Each of the Lord's apostles is in a position to observe and feel the love that Heavenly Father has for His children, particularly for those who are struggling. He cares deeply about those who have strayed from the covenant path, especially when they fear there is no way back. My dear young friends, there is always a way back. Jesus Christ and His gospel is the way. You have not committed any sin so serious that you are beyond the reach of the Savior's love and atoning grace. As you take steps to repent and follow God's laws, you will begin to feel just how much Heavenly Father and His beloved Son want you back home with them. They want you to be happy. They will do anything within their power that does not violate your agency or their laws to help you come back. How I cherish the privilege of feeling their love for you. Sometimes we as leaders of the Church are criticized for holding firm to the laws of God, defending the Savior's doctrine, and resisting the social pressures of our day. But our commission as ordained apostles is to go into all the world to preach His gospel into every creature. That means we are commanded to teach truth. In doing so, sometimes we are accused of being uncaring as we teach the Father's requirements for exaltation in the celestial kingdom. But wouldn't it be far more uncaring for us not to tell the truth, not to teach what God has revealed? It is precisely because we do care deeply about all of God's children that we proclaim His truth. We may not always tell people what they want to hear. Prophets are rarely popular. <laughs> but we will always teach the truth. My dear young friends, exaltation is not easy. Requirements include a focused and persistent effort to keep God's laws and rigorously repenting when we don't. But the reward for doing so is far greater than anything we can imagine because it brings us joy here and never-ending happiness hereafter. Thus, our commission as apostles is to teach nothing but truth. That commission does not give us the authority to modify divine law. For example, let's consider the definition of marriage. In recent years, many countries, including the United States, have legalized same-sex marriage. As members of the Church, we respect the laws of the land and abide by them, including civil marriage. The truth is, however, that in the beginning, in the beginning, marriage was ordained by God. And to this day, it is defined by Him as being between a man and a woman. God has not changed His definition of marriage. God has also not changed His law of chastity. Requirements to enter the temple have not changed, and our desire for there to be love at home and harmony between parent and child has not changed. Though we of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles cannot change the laws of God, we do have the charge to build up the Church and regulate all the affairs of the same in all nations. Thus we can adjust policy when the Lord directs us to do so. You have recently seen such examples because the restoration is ongoing, policy changes will likely and surely continue. 
Perhaps I can illustrate this through policy adjustments regarding those who identify themselves as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, LGBT, and their children. I realize that other initials could be added to this acronym, but LGBT should suffice for the purpose of my message. Consider the policy announced in November 2015 related to the advisability of baptism for children of LGBT parents. Our concern then, and one which we discussed at length and prayed about fervently over a long period of time, was to find a way to reduce friction between gay or lesbian parents and their children. Because parents are the primary exemplars for their children, we did not want to put young children in the position of having to choose between beliefs and behavior that they learned at home and what they were taught at church. We wanted to facilitate harmony in the home and avoid pitting children and parents against each other. Thus, in 2015, the policy was made to assist children and their parents in this circumstance, namely that children being raised by LGBT parents would not automatically be eligible for baptism at age eight. Exceptions to this policy would require First Presidency approval. The First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve have com continued to seek the Lord's guidance and to plead with Him in behalf of His children who were affected by the 2015 policy. We knew that this policy created concern and confusion for some and heartache for others. That grieved us. Whenever the sons and daughters of God weep, for whatever reason, we weep. So our supplications to the Lord continued. We also took note of LGBT parents who sought permission from the First Presidency for their children to be baptized. In nearly every case where the LGBT parents agreed to teach their children about and be supportive of the covenant of baptism, the requested exception was granted. As a result of our continued supplication, we recently felt directed to adjust the policy such that the baptism of children of LGBT parents may be authorized by bishops without First Presidency approval if the custodial parents requested the baptism and understand that a child will be taught about sacred covenants to be made at baptism. We also determined that LGBT parents may request that a baby be named and blessed by one who worthily holds the Melchizedek priesthood. It is important that these parents understand that ward members will contact them periodically and that when a child who has been blessed reaches eight years of age, local leaders will recommend that the child be baptized. Finally, we also clarified that homosexual immorality would be treated in the eyes of the Church in the same manner as heterosexual immorality. Though it may not have looked this way to some, the 2015 and 2019 policy adjustments on this matter were both motivated by love, the love of our Heavenly Father for His children and the love of the brethren for those whom we serve. Because we feel the depth of God's love for His children, we care deeply about every child of God, regardless of age, personal circumstances, gender, sexual orientation, or other unique challenges. Now for the fifth truth. You may know for yourself what is true and what is not by learning to discern the whisperings of the Spirit. For the Spirit speaketh truth and lieth not. It speaks of things as they really are and of things as they really will be. 
My dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to seek earnestly a confirmation from the Spirit that what I've told you is true and is from the Lord. With President Nelson's remarks still vivid in our minds, let's finish this up by hearing what John DeLynn had to say about what he calls a post-Mormon community for those individuals who leave the church for whatever reason they felt it necessary to leave. One of the things that has troubled me so greatly since that conversation that we had at lunch is when we asked you, what is the thing you miss most about the LDS church? You said being a part of a community based on good morals and that you have tried time and time again to recreate such a community in a secular form and that it never ever works and always dilutes into drinking drugs or swinging. Okay, that's your restatement of the conversation. And so I correct me where, if, I that's, if that's I understand, incorrect. I understand how you piece that together. There's no way on earth I said exactly what you just said. There's a lot of nuance mm -hmm. and subtlety to that conversation that we had. Mm -hmm. I will, so I'll let, can I speak for myself? No, I'm asking you to clarify it. Okay, so what I would say is I definitely miss uh, a lot about the community of uh, the church. I think the church excels at creating community, community that can be very nurturing and, and, and supportive um, in raising a family and having a family in doing life. Mm -hmm. So I will absolutely give the church strong marks in terms of a certain type of community that it creates. And I do miss that. Mm -hmm. So that part of what you said, I agree with, mm -hmm. but there are some caveats. Mm -hmm. The community can be very superficial. Mm -hmm. So try getting excommunicated or try saying in church that you don't believe what some of the prophets say, mm -hmm. that community can disappear very quickly. Mm -hmm. Or try being gay like mm -hmm. Gerardo and marrying your partner and showing up at church and wanting to be a member in full standing. Mm -hmm. And you can see that community evaporate very quickly. Mm -hmm. So yes, Mormonism was a phenomenal community for me as a white, straight, heterosexual, cisgender, male with pioneer heritage mm -hmm. i but i would have also said in that conversation that the community that i experienced as deeply gratifying and supportive can be deadly literally deadly for somebody with a different color skin or a different gender or a different sexual orientation or a different gender identity so i that's an important caveat that i would have said then mm -hmm. and that's important for me to say now mm -hmm. that's the first thing the second thing is I did not, I would not say that um, Mormons are on average more moral than ex-Mormons. Mm -hmm. I would say that on average, Mormons, active, faithful, believing Mormons probably drink less than ex-Mormons. And the extent to which alcohol can be harmful, mm -hmm. okay, so Mormons on average, probably who are active and faithful have less mm -hmm. alcohol problems. Mm -hmm. I would I would say that's true, mm -hmm. right? We only have to look to Hulu to know that Mormons can be swingers. Mm -hmm. So while I have noticed that sometimes there's sexual ex experimentation outside of, of Orthodox Mormonism or drug use or alcohol use or whatever, that's also inside Mormonism. The thing you're doing right now, though, is you're using an exception to argue the rule. And so what we're trying to talk about is the rule and using a small exception to argue the rule is not just a good it's not good for conversation. I mean, or you like could say the same thing about gay people. And let's, let's just not think about that mm -hmm. because this is only five percent of the population. Mm -hmm. Well, I, well, I think that there's there there are answers out there. I think there is an answer. I don't know what the exact answer is for intersex. I don't I, I don't know what that is. Uh, what I do know is that I, I believe that the family proclamation in the world and the conceptualization that gender wow. is eternal, mm -hmm. I, I do, that, that rings true. Did you, did you know that some, mm -hmm. um, believing, um, uh, transgender people believe in the family proclamation and that when it says gender is eternal, it means that their gender that they believe they should they are, be, yeah. that's the one that's eternal. Basically mm -hmm. they were born a male. But they feel like they're a female. Mm -hmm. They feel like eternally they're female. Mm -hmm. uh, I think From there's a difference side. between okay, let's um, there's this new science um, discovery and let's embrace it as in, in Mormonism mm -hmm. versus 
we're going to call out science and say science is bad and that's wrong and evolution is wrong. And I'll tell you another one, interracial marriage, it's against mm -hmm. doctrine. And we're going to sign documents by the first presidency and saying that interracial marriage is against doctrine. Mm -hmm. And you can't marry people of, uh, of different races, especially mm -hmm. people from Africa. Yeah. Um, and we're going to tell you that if you do that, you're going to lose your temple recommend. Do you white person marrying a black person? You're also cursed mm -hmm. because, uh, and your, and your children are also going to be cursed and they're not going to be able to get the temple blessings or, you know, or have the priesthood and you cannot be sealed and go, go to heaven with your family forever because mm -hmm. these people are, you know, doomed to be servants in the, in the hereafter mm -hmm. and, and separated from their family. Do I? Do I love your vision of instead of deconstructing an engine, um, a, a vision of a community built on self self development and creation and growth? Yes, I love that. Right, but but what do you do when your cousin or your son or your friend comes to you and says, "I'm gay." Mm -hmm. The church taught me that it was an abomination to be gay, mm -hmm. but I can't change. Mm -hmm. I've, I served a mission. I prayed. I had three callings. Mm -hmm. I got married to a woman, mm -hmm. and it doesn't go away, mm -hmm. and I just want to kill myself, which mm -hmm. many, many, many gay people have mm -hmm. done. Many, many gay Mormons have done. Mm -hmm. And then you get a PhD in psychology, and you realize that they don't change. Mm -hmm. I, I surveyed 1,612 mm -hmm current and former Mormons, you know how many were, you know what percentage who tried to change their sexual orientation were able to get rid of their same sex attraction? Give me a number. I don't know. I'm not going to guess. Zero percent. Mm -hmm. So with Dr. Lynn's criticisms fresh in her mind, I have to ask, when these post-Mormons leave the church, what community can they go to to replace the community that was such a big part of their daily lives? It certainly isn't to the Thrive community you and your wife, John, have tried to create for them, for you yourself have said that it didn't work or provide what their souls were looking for. I know that many turn to the Christian community, but in time they realize that they have to apply the same criteria they used to condemn and deconstruct the church in them to the Christian church and apply it there, and ultimately they end up turning to atheism, most of them, losing their faith entirely. I think what Dr. DeLynn said here about this need for community was very honest, transparent, and enlightening. And so I respect him for admitting that. I also want to say that what Gerardo said about some of the faith-destroying complexities that have emerged over recent years, all of which have contributed to his faith crisis, the issues found in the LGBTQ plus community and the gender and transgender community are indeed having an impact on many of God's children and the complexities they face where they find themselves struggling with what I have come to believe for the most part has to do with their mental state. Before you judge me for what I just said and misunderstand what I said, I would encourage you to, uh, viewers to go to YouTube and watch the video titled Being Transgender in the Mormon Church, which is a personal video story of a young woman who, after her mission, transitioned to becoming a transgender man who ultimately completed her transition with upper body surgery and yet continues to maintain her membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as an active member of the church. I mention it here because I feel her story offers an honest and non-biased view of what Dr. DeLynn is talking about in terms of these individuals' unique struggle with where they find themselves. It describes in vivid reality what I'm talking about when I say that gender dysphoria, bipolar, and um, neurodivergence and others, to name just a few of the states of mind people are dealing with today, it's, and is their reality. There's also the complex issues uh, Gerardo uh, brought up for interracial marriage from years past, polygamy and gay marriage, which are no small concerns, that's for sure, and blacks and the priesthood is another one. These kind of complexities have most certainly taken their toll on thousands of individuals who have experienced what John and uh, Gerardo are, I'm pronouncing his name, I apologize, are describing in their interview with Paul Brothers. I will say this, to me, it seems that it might be possible that during the gestation process of an embryo becoming a fully developed person, there could be a mishap or misfiring within the cells of the embryo, which is what is called uh, during the first eight weeks of the 
gestation period where the embryo takes a turn in its development so that it zigs when it should have zagged in its development. The same could happen during the development of the fetus, which is what's called after the first eight weeks of development. The zig is what we would call a birth defect, like a fetus developing blindness, or a brain injury causing mental disabilities, or any other possible birth defect. This happens every day all across the world because it zigs, its development goes on down the female route to completion when it was supposed to have gone down the male route to completion. That said, I do uh, have to say that I don't know what percentage of human beings feel this mental identity conflict within their minds. Which mental conflict is called gender dysphoria? But I do know that for some people it is very, very real. But I think a better question we should be asking ourselves here is when does the spirit body enter its physical body? Do we even know the exact timing of this process of becoming a living soul? Does the spirit enter prior to when the fetus begins to develop its female or male characteristics, which usually takes place around nine weeks, the doctors say, where in um, then goes on to complete its specific gender identity solidifying process? Or is it after that period of development? Another question I have asked myself is, does the spirit direct the development of its own human development to boyhood or girlhood? I don't know nor does anyone else for that, as far as I know. To say it is one way or the other would be pure conjecture right now, since God has not yet revealed anything on this topic in objective truth terms. I also know there are people who choose to pursue a certain sexual lifestyle that is contrary to God's law of chastity, just as I also know that there are folks who believe they were born as a certain gender but are living in a physical body that's the opposite gender of how they see themselves and that they did not choose this gender. These folks say that they were born that way. Another question I ask myself is, is this like the young woman who sees herself as really fat but in actuality, she's thin like a rail. Are both of these just a state of mind that comes from a misfiring brain? Both are truly an extremely hard deck of cards to swallow, that's for sure. Like I said, is gender dysphoria and body dysmorphia a brain misfiring and this is a mental illness of sorts? Or is it just a willful choice that one makes while under the influence of their life's mental mapping due to their associations throughout their life, etc.? In other words, it is an act of rebellion, or is it just the result of a birth defect or human disease, which is a natural circumstance that comes with this fallen world? Again, I go back to the question, is it simply a state of mind of some kind? As John answered one of the Paul brothers' questions saying, I don't know, I too will say that I don't know all of the answers to these questions of human complexity. But what I will say is that just like a heterosexual man or woman is commanded by our Creator to live the law of chastity, so too is the homosexual man or gay man or gay woman commanded to live the law of chastity. Gay being a genetic term for someone who is attracted to their same sex. This law applies to everyone. It is difficult, and for some it can seem near impossible to comply with this law. Yes, for some, being celibate until one marries in the way God has ordained marriage to be is a most difficult thing to comply with because of the strong sexual drive and passions all of us have been given and blessed with in our bodies, with our bodies and minds. It is not just the LGBTQIA23 plus community who are being asked to keep the law of chastity. It is the entirety of God's family. For this eternal law is at the heart and center of celestial family life and is the law of heaven and of its celestial society. Like the Paul brothers tried to explain to Dr. Deland, there are the leaves and the branches to the doctrinal tree of Jesus Christ's gospel, which are the secondary questions. And then there are the roots of the doctrinal tree that are the primary questions. I have tried to focus on the primary questions that John and Geraldo brought up during their interview with Hayden and Jackson. And I have purposely left the questions about polygamy or plural marriage, gay and same-sex marriage, interracial marriage, and blacks being restricted from holding the priesthood. Every one of these issues are part of the complex and controversial issues of the past, and so I left them out of this discussion because there's been thousands of books and articles written on them, as well as multiple papers published on every one of these secondary, secondary questions by people who are much smarter and more educated than I am. These are academics that have spent their adult lives studying these issues, but what I am comfortable commenting on is the question of whether or not being gay is a sin. 
John said he was taught that being gay was an abomination as he grew up. Well, I'm from the same generation in the LDS Church's history. I turned 18 back in July of 1973 when I went on my mission, and so I was a teenager from 1967 to 1974. We're talking about the Zeke guys of the 60s and 70s, the era of Woodstock and the Flower Child. What I was taught during those years, which was more than 50 years ago, was that having gay sex was the abomination, and not just having the gay proclivity or attractions for one's same gender. Just as having strong attraction towards girls or women as a heterosexual male has that same drive. Having those feelings of attraction were not an abomination, but acting on those attractions was. In other words, it was having heterosexual sex outside of marriage, called fornication or adultery, that was the abomination in the eyes of God. Both of these choices to break the law of chastity was rebellion against and being disobedient to God's law of chastity. And it is this rebellion that would ultimately bring upon you or me the judgments of God. Any person and any nation that fails to keep the law of chastity will ultimately in time, when they are fully ripened in this iniquity, will come to its destruction. In support of my perspective on this sensitive and complex issue, I want to make one more comment. I want you to consider those individuals you know who have been dealt the cards of mental illness, or what I prefer to call a mental disability, it being no different than someone born with a birth defect like blindness, or a genital heart disease, or a missing limb. There are literally thousands of different birth defects that are possible to be when, goes the, when people go through the process of birth. The brain is a very complex organ that can produce a variety of disorders on many different spectrums, causing the person to think and do many things that a normal healthy brain does not do. For me, it is important that we separate the person from their mental state of mind, meaning for their illness or disability, their birth defects, so that we don't perpetuate the stigma that demeans the individual's true identity as a valued child of God. So, with that said, I want to close this video off by playing for you a short video that shares the same sentiments that I myself have towards not only our gay and transgender members, but on everyone who may be suffering from some form of mental disability and birth defect. Know that I love you as a child of God, which you are. I want anyone who is a member of the church who is gay or lesbian to know I believe you have a place in the kingdom and recognize that sometimes it may be difficult for you to see where you fit in the Lord's Church, but you do. We need to listen to and understand what our LGBT brothers and sisters are feeling and experiencing. Certainly, we must do better than we have done in the past so that all members feel they have a spiritual home where their brothers and sisters love them, and where they have a place to worship and serve the Lord. So there you go. That's part three of my 10-part series of videos on the 10 big questions. I look forward to next time. But until then, I want to wish you continued success, and may God bless you always. Goodbye.